This Parsha podcast is sponsored by my dear friend Dan Coleman in honor of his brother David and his lovely family. Before we begin this edition of the Parsha podcast, I want to give a quick plug to my sixth podcast that I'm pleased to announce that as of a couple of weeks ago, I have, uh, thank God, launched the Mitzvah podcast. This is a podcast that attempts to go through all 613 mitzvahs and give the audience a snapshot of each mitzvah. Every week, there's going to be a new mitzvah podcast, please God, going to be uploaded on Thursday. And if you like some of my content in the Parsha podcast and all the other variety of podcasts that we are offering, please check it out, The Mitzvah Podcast by Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. It's not going to be a comprehensive take on each mitzvah. Each mitzvah, we're going to dedicate around 20 to 30 minutes, typically, discussing the mitzvah in general, some of the laws and some of the applications and some of the principles and some of some of the interesting things related to it from our sages. And if you want to get like a snapshot on all the mitzvahs, this is a very good podcast, in my opinion, to do it with. The Mitzvah Podcast, check it out on Apple Podcasts and wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, you could always email me for any questions or comments. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Parsha's Bakude is the final Parsha, the final Torah section in the book of Exodus. And this is the fifth week in a row that the primary subject matter, or at least a partial subject matter of the Parsha, is going to be the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the portable temple that the Jewish people are going to be building. As we mentioned last week, the first two and a half Parshios talking about the Mishkan are going to be detailing the instructions. And last week, we had the implementation when they actually did the construction, the assembly of the materials and the building of the edifice itself and its vessels. And this week is going to wrap up the discussion of the Mishkan and also going to tell us about the creation of the special garments for the high priest. And of course, the question that has accompanied us since the inception of the discussion of the Mishkan is going to be again addressed today, and that is why does the Torah need to belabor the instructions and the implementations and give us so many details, seemingly repetitive and redundant, about the Mishkan, about the tabernacle, and we're going to try to attempt to address those questions again in this parsha, Parshas Pekude, a parsha consisting of 92 verses, no mitzvos, and like we mentioned last week, it's typically lumped together with previous parsha because this year is a leap year, therefore Parshas Pekude and last week's parsha, Vayakel, are separated. So the parsha begins with a counting of the materials used, or some of the materials used for the tabernacle. And the word pekude means counting, or translated sometimes as reckoning. These are the reckonings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which were reckoned by Moshe, the labor of the Levites, under the authority of Isamar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. And right away, Rashi tells us one of the major themes of the Mishkan the reason why the tabernacle is called the tabernacle of testimony because it serves as testimony to the fact that the Almighty forgave the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf. A few weeks ago, we read the Jewish people wanted to do an idol, and that, of course, was a terrible sin. And nonetheless, despite the fact that Jewish people seem to have repudiated God, still he agreed in the tabernacle to dwell amongst us, to have his presence, his shina, dwell amongst us, and therefore... This Mishkan serves as a testimony to that. And one of the other commentaries points out that if you look at the format of this verse, it begins, these are the reckonings, Ele Pekudeh Mishkan. And he points out that in the episode of the golden calf in chapter 32, verse 4 of Exodus, it says, Ela, the same word, these are your gods, O Israel, who took you out of the land of Egypt. And the commentary suggests that there's a certain connection between the sin, so to speak, the sin of the golden calf that expelled God, so to speak, or repelled God away from us, and the expiation of that, the fixing of that that we have over here with the Mishkan, that it too has the word Ela, these, because it is the fixing, it is the amending of the sin of the golden calf. Now, the Parsha is going to begin like we mentioned earlier, with counting the gold, how much gold was there, what was the total weight of gold, what was the total weight of the 
assembled silver and copper. And there's a very lengthy midrash here about the reason why we have to begin again to talk about the supplies that were donated and also to list them, to make like this list of how much, how many pounds, so to speak, how much weight do we get of gold, silver, and of copper. And the midrash tells us that there were scoffers amongst the Jewish people. And they were snickering behind Moses' back. And they were saying, ooh, Moses is raising all this money, all this gold, all this silver to build a tabernacle. And it's stored in this big storage house. I bet Moses is taking a cut of the money. And therefore, when Moses found out about that, he said, oh, okay, you suspecting me of taking a cut of illegally embezzling some of the money that was designated for the tabernacle. When we're done here, I promise that we're going to make an accounting, we're going to make a reckoning, we're going to see exactly how much came in, and I'll prove beyond any doubt that I didn't take anything. I was completely honest. I acted with complete integrity in overseeing the materials for the Mishkan. And the Midrash goes on to say, quoting the Talmud, that with regards to appointing someone to oversee matters of the public, if that job is a job that involves public funds, if you have someone who's in charge, let's say, of the shul treasury or the school treasury, whatever it is, if there's public funds that need to be overseen, it should not be one person and one person alone that has the keys to the coffers. There should be a minimum of two, and that way they'll have to collaborate in order to steal. Same thing over here. Moses, even though if anyone is unimpeachable, if anyone is a beyond reproach, of course, it's, it's Moses. But nevertheless, he insisted to always have Isamar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, always have him with him, never to be suspected of any sort of graft or embezzlement or stealing from the public funds. The story is told about one of the prime ministers of Israel, Levi Eshkol, in the 1960s, that he told the emissaries of the state of Israel that when they go to America to raise funds for the state, it's okay if they pocket a little bit. You know, it's very hard to expect them to be completely honest. We can expect that. A little bit is okay. That's understood. That is expected. Not so with Moses. Moses didn't take anything. And perhaps one of the reasons why the Torah details Uh, the accounting and and going through exactly what all the funds were uh, appropriated for is to reinforce this idea that Moses didn't take anything for himself. And the Midrash adds that when Moses went in to the storage house where they kept all the gold and silver, he had a special garment, a garment fashioned that had no pockets. So that way no one should even suspect him. No one should have any grounds to say, oh, Moses pocketed something. He had a special garment uh, created, one that had no pockets, to just demonstrate that he is clean both in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. And I have a personal story about someone with similar honesty and integrity, and that is my grandfather, Rabbi Shlomo Wolby of blessed memory. During the war years... He was in neutral Sweden uh, from 1938 until 1946. And the reason why is because he was a German citizen. And as a student of the Mir Yeshiva in Poland, because he was there on a visa as a German in 1938, they refused to renew any visa belonging to a German national for obvious reasons. And therefore, he had to go out to Germany. And that, of course, is a bad idea. It's not the best thing to go back to Germany in 1938. So what to do? He tried to get back to Poland, but they refused to give him a new visa. He ended up getting a three-month visa. But as he's trying to figure out his affairs, he gets invited to come to Stockholm in Sweden to be a teacher for a family there. They needed a teacher for their children, teach them Judaics, to teach them Torah, and therefore he ended up there. And for the duration of the war, he was saved uh, because he was no longer on the continental Europe and he was in the one country in the region that was completely neutral. And while he was in Sweden, he played a very vital role for his comrades in the Mir Yeshiva. And I've told the story before in previous podcasts, 
but the entire yeshiva, which is faculty and students alike of this mir yeshiva in Poland, they all ended up getting visas and passports to go to Shanghai in Japanese-occupied China. Initially, they were in Japan, in Kobe, Japan, but eventually ended up in Shanghai. And for the duration of the war, while the war was raging on in Europe, the entire yeshiva, the entire student body and, and faculty were there in, in China and Japan. Now, the problem was is that to sustain such a yeshiva, you need to have funds, and like every nonprofit, you have to raise funds from benevolent donors. The problem is, in, in China and Japan, it's not exactly, especially during the war, it's not exactly fertile grounds for fundraising for yeshivos. So they had Rabbi Avraham Kalmanovich, he was a rabbi in New York, and he took upon himself the effort to try to fundraise for the yeshiva and for their students. And he raised millions of dollars in America from wealthy donors who wanted to apportion their money towards the yeshiva. The problem was that the United States and Japan, and included in that as Japanese occupied China, they were at war. And when there is a war between two countries, there is no mail service, there's no postal service between the, between the two countries. So how do you get the money from New York to Shanghai to help the yeshiva that was in grave need? So what they used to do was they would send the money to my grandfather in neutral Sweden. And because Sweden was neutral, it had postal relations both with the United States and with Japan. They'd send him the money and he would repackage it, pull off all the American insignia and send it to Japan as if he himself was sending it. And we know that he didn't touch a nickel of that money. Despite the fact that my grandfather, of blessed memory, was subsisting on a starvation diet himself, the money was not his. The money was apportioned to the yeshiva. And even though he was doing a vital service for the yeshiva, he didn't take for himself a salary, any sort of cut. And in fact, regarding this unparalleled honesty and integrity, one of the great Torah sages of his era quipped, the reason why he merited such superlative success in all his endeavors, was due to his total honesty in managing this funds. After the war, he sent a detailed letter to Rabbi Avram Kalmanovich, to the one who fundraised all the money, delineating with complete precision every dollar in, every dollar out, dates, times, everything with precision all the way down to the last Penny. That is the attitude that we see here with Moses, despite the fact that there's incredible amounts of gold, silver, other precious materials, Moses is totally honest and acting with complete integrity. And the Torah goes on to say, how much gold do we have, how much silver do we have, and how much copper? And the numbers are pretty astronomical. There is 29 talents of gold. A talent of gold is about 100 pounds of gold, an incredible amount of gold, and uh, even more silver. And one of the commentaries that Sephora tells us something very interesting. He says if you compare the amount of gold and precious materials used in the Mishkan, yes, it's a lot, but compared to what was used in the first and second temple, when the Mishkan is, of course, a portable temple, and you could disassemble it, move it, and when you get to your new location, put it together again. But once you have a permanent temple, it's a much larger edifice. And there's much more gold, both in the first temple built by Solomon, the second temple and that was, of course, refurbished by Herod to be made the most beautiful building in the world with incredible amounts of gold that dwarfed what we have over here. Says the Sepharno, there's an incredible lesson here. The reason why God dwells amongst the Jewish people and in the Mishkan has nothing to do with the amount of gold. Rather, it has to do with their character. Because these people feared God, their actions made them worthy of God dwelling amongst them. Therefore, the peak of divine presence amongst the Jewish people was in the Mishkan. It was still still present in the first temple, but once the second temple came around, it was much more diminished. Uh, And despite the fact that all the gold, 
the gold is not what brings God. It is the character of the nation that has built and that is living with the temple or the tabernacle. Now, we're told that there's a hundred talents of silver, and there's also a hundred silver sockets, and each one of those silver sockets is one talent of silver. Now it is it's interesting now it's interesting that of that the majority of the items that were fundraised for the Mishkan were done based upon the largesse and magnanimity of the donors. There was only one thing that was obligatory for everyone, and that is the half shekel that everyone gave, and that was used to make these silver sockets that go underneath at the base of the walls of the Mishnah, the walls of the tabernacle, and they were used to hold up the wooden beams. And I think maybe there's a, there's a deep lesson here that, you know, the Jewish people, they can have a relationship with God that is embodied by the tabernacle. And the great relationship, of course, is there's all these things that, that the two partners in the relationship do for each other they, they do have the goodness of their heart. They're inspired. They're generous. They want to act good towards their partner. However, every great relationship, it's not enough to have the things that you do of the goodness of your heart. There has to be a basis of obligation. The foundation has to be obligation. Similarly, a few weeks ago, we had, of course, the episode of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, and we read quite interestingly, that the Jewish people, they committed themselves. They were in. They said, nah, seven Ishma, we will do and we will listen. Whatever God tells us, we're on board. Yet, the Talmud tells us that despite the fact the Jewish people voluntarily agreed to be all in, God took the mountain and wielded it on top of them and said, you better accept the Torah or else I crush you to death over here. I don't get it. If the Jewish people already pledged that they are in, why did God need to wheel the mountain over them? Why did he need to force them to accept it based upon this obligation? And the answer is that despite the fact that Jewish people, they agreed to adopt the Torah, the foundation of everything is the obligation. I think, you know, similarly with, with marriage, any, any sort of relationship, but certainly marriage, the couple loves each other, and that's amazing. And if they don't have that, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. But there's still a certain concretization, there's still a certain commitment that the marriage begins with. It's not enough to have the love, you also have to have the commitment, and that's the way to ensure a harmonious and lasting relationship. And one of the commentaries tells us something very fascinating. The Balhaturim here says that the hundred silver sockets that held up the beams, they correspond to the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that every day we're supposed to make a hundred blessings. Of course, when we pray, there's all kinds of blessings that we say when we pray, when you eat, when you go to the bathroom, but the sum total every day should be a minimum of 100 blessings. Now, if you just say the three daily prayers, you have about 90 or so. So all you need is to eat a few things, and if you make before blessings and after blessings, go to the bathroom a couple of times, you should have it covered every day. But the Talmud says that you have to have 100 blessings a day. And it's an interesting correlation here, an interesting comparison that these silver sockets that lie at the basis of the mission of the tabernacle, they correspond to the hundred blessings that we say every day. Every time we say, Baruch HaTah Hashem, blessed be Hashem, we're again reinforcing this relationship that we have with God, reminding ourselves of the obligation to thank Him before we partake in the pleasures of this world. And that creates the basis of our internal mission, our internal tabernacle, our internal relationship that we have with God that is manifested with our daily blessings. Okay, so we have counted the amount of gold and silver. The Torah tells us again how much a copper. There were 70 talents of copper. And then we're going to talk about the creation of the vestments of the garments of Aaron, the high priest. Chapter 39 begins from the turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool. They made knit vestments to serve in the sanctuary and they made the holy vestments for Aaron as Hashem commanded 
Moses. Now, it's interesting, this is the first of more than a dozen times that this formulation appears in the parsha, as Hashem commanded Moses. Everything that Moses did and he directed Betzalel and Ahali of the people that were in charge of this whole operation, everything was done precisely, exactly as God commanded Moses. Now, the fact that it's repeated again and again should, of course, raise some eyebrows. Wouldn't it be sufficient to just say it once at the end? Wouldn't that tell us that same message? Why is there a need to repeatedly tell us that everything that was done was done as God commanded Moses? So maybe there's several answers here. Uh, One of the answers is that Moses is creating or is overseeing the garments that are going to be given to Aaron. And as we mentioned a few weeks ago, Aaron himself was really not supposed to be the high priest. It was supposed to be Moses. So Moses has to come and craft or oversee the crafting of the garments that are given to his brother who is supplanting him, who maybe in his eyes could have been usurping him as the high priest. Nevertheless, he didn't deviate at all from his commandment of his instruction. Everything he did, he did exactly the way God commanded him. He wasn't at all adding any enmity or any biases vis-a-vis these garments. He just did everything exactly the way God commanded him. Alternatively, there's another deep lesson here uh, that we find by some of the commentaries. And they suggest, like we said earlier, that really the tabernacle is a reflection of the atonement for the golden calf. The golden calf There was a lot of reasons why the Jewish people decided that this was the proper thing to do. And of course, in our eyes, they made a serious blunder, and they did. But they had their justifications. They said, well, we we need someone to replace Moses, and this made sense. And they had all kinds of justifications, but ultimately, they did it on their own. And they forgot that really what they should have done is say, what does God want us to do? And therefore, how do you fix The problem of the golden calf, the problem of the people acting independently, irrespective of the will of God, you again and again and again repeat, this I'm doing because God commanded us, God instructed us exactly the way God instructed Moses. By closing out your own mind, by stopping to invest your own perspective on the matter, What you think about it doesn't matter. It's only what God says. That is the way to fix the sin of taking your own good intentions and creating something akin to idolatry. So we begin with the aphod. The aphod is that apron-like garment. It's made of gold, turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, and twisted linen. And we've already described what it looks like. It has the the two shoulder straps that go on top. On the two shoulder straps, you have those shoham stones, which connect to the choshen, the breastplate uh, that goes on the chest of of Aaron. Again, it lists the 12 stones of the choshen upon which the names of the children of Israel, the tribes of the Jewish people, were etched. Now, it is interesting that these 12 stones, the Torah gives us the names of these 12 stones, but collectively they're called the Avne Miluim. So there's, a, there's really 14 stones, two of them that go on the shoulder pads of the aphod, and 12 of them go on the choshen, go on the breastplate. And they are called collectively the avne shoham, the shoham stones that go on the shoulders, and the avne miluim. Now what does that mean? This group of 12 precious stones, each engraved with the name of one of the tribes, They're inlaid in 12 gold settings in the breastplate, and each one of them are quite expensive and very valuable. Yet the Torah collectively calls them the Avne Milum, which means literally the filler stones, referring to the fact that they fill the gold settings in the Choshen in the breastplate. It's kind of odd. Why would the Torah refer to these incredibly valuable, precious, very expensive stones simply by the fact that they fill the void in the Choshen in the gold settings in the breastplate. Maybe the answer is that the most important job that anyone could do is to do the job that needs to get done. And therefore, yes, these stones on their own are very valuable, but even more valuable, even more precious than the stones themselves is the fact that they have a role. 
And the role is there's a void in the Choshen, and they have to fill that job. And sometimes, I think the lesson for us is that sometimes the jobs that we need to do are not so glamorous, and they're not so exciting, but even when they are glamorous, we have to realize that what we really need to do is, is we're put into this world, we're giving our mission, and our mission is to do whatever it is that needs to get done, and that's our job, that's our responsibility. Now, the Talmud tells us something very fascinating, that the names of the 12 tribes were etched onto these 12 stones. How exactly were they etched? You would think maybe with a chisel, maybe, with, maybe they were written down in paint or with ink. Says the Talmud, no, there's a special animal. It's very small. It's the size of a barley, and it's called a shamir. And this animal, in fact, the Talmud tells us, is one of the 10 themes that were created during the first week of creation between Friday and Shabbos, at that twilight period where Friday is almost over and Shabbos is almost beginning. It's kind of that overlapping time between Friday and Shabbos. That's the time that there were 10 things that were created. And the commonality that that these 10 items share is the fact that they are hybrids. Shabbos, of course, is a day that's all spiritual. And then even the six days that are physical, that are material. The themes that were created between Friday and Shabbos during that twilight zone, those are the things that are, that are the hybrids. This shamir, this special animal, it's a worm of sorts, that was created during that twilight zone. And the way the engravings were done is that they would write the letters of the names of the tribes, and then they would have this animal trace those letters, and as it traced it, it had some sort of power that it would etch into the stones those names. A pretty interesting thing, the Talmud goes on to say, well, how do you actually transport it? Everything you put it in, it would continually etch it. The Talmud even says that if you put it on top of a mountain, this small little animal put on top of a mountain, if it goes over the mountain, whatever whatever covers, it's totally splitting. So if it's on a mountain, it's splitting the whole mountain. And again, this is something that it's very hard for modern ears to absorb, uh, that there's such an animal that has such powers, but think of it as some sort of nuclear bomb. It's, it's really not a lot of material, but it has incredible force. I don't know, it's a laser. It's some sort of power that is condensed in this very special animal, and it was able to split uh, the stone and etch in it the names of the Jewish people. And the Talmud goes on to tell us that when King Solomon constructed the first temple, he had to cut stone. And the problem is you cannot cut stone, again, to make the walls of the temple. You can't cut stone with metal. That's a prohibition. You can't use metal to cut any of the stones used in the, in the temple. So what did he do? He found this shamir, and this shamir, the special animal, cut the stones for him. Pretty cool. After we read about the aphod, we read about the rest of the garments of the high priest, we read about the me'il, which is the robe, and the various tunics, and the head plates, and the crown, and finally everything has been concluded. Verse 32, we read, All the work of the tabernacle, the tent of meaning, was completed, and the children of Israel done everything that Hashem commanded Moses, so did they do. They're finished with the work, and they bring it to Moses. They brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all its utensils, its hooks, its planks, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the cover, the ark, various other vessels, everything they bring it to Moses, everything they did precisely the way God commanded Moses, Moses saw the entire work, and behold, they had done it as Hashem commanded, so had they done, and Moses blessed them. So I want to kind of circle back to the central question that the commentaries discuss on this parsha. Again, if you look at a retrospective of the book of Exodus, you have the five final parshios almost exclusively dedicated to building the tabernacle, and we have what seems like tremendous repetition with the instruction and then the assembly and then at every stage of the way kind of taking and accounting. I want to suggest another way to maybe understand this whole idea. Again, we have the instructions to build the tabernacle, all its vessels and all the garments of the high priest 
in the middle, you have the story of the golden calf, and then you have the instruction being implemented afterwards. I want to suggest that maybe there's another deep lesson here, and that is to build something great, you first need to flounder. Earlier failure is almost inevitable if the accomplishment is really great. And there's a, there's a midrash that says, quoting a verse in scripture, that if I didn't have darkness, if I didn't have the earlier struggle, I wouldn't have the light that I have today. And the Talmud, in fact, tells us that for us to do a mitzvah perfectly, which is really the goal of why we're here, we first have to do a mitzvah imperfectly. And even though doing a mitzvah imperfectly is problematic, after all, how could you do a mitzvah that's not perfect? But really, that's the only path forward. The, the blunder is really the first step of growth. The lower runs of the ladder are low for a reason because they're really rife with mistakes and you really can't skip it. There's no way to leapfrog the problems, the errors, the blunders in whatever project it is and just have success out of the gate. And the Talmud of the book of Gittin, page 43a, tells us, even with regards to Torah, a person cannot understand the words of Torah well unless they first have failure. Failure is not incidental to the future growth. The scripture tells us that the tzaddik, the righteous one, falls seven times and keeps on getting up. So we think maybe, well, despite the fact that the tzaddik, the righteous one, faltered seven times, he still gets up. But really the answer is no. That because the tzaddik faltered seven times, that's the reason why he became the great person that he became. And this is something that we see throughout history. The major efforts to do anything great, they kind of trip up at the beginning until eventually they arrive at the ultimate accomplishment that they need, that they eventually become. So if you think about the Mishkan, you know, you have this planning, this coordination, this effort into a major project to have the Almighty dwell amongst us. And you're sure that everything's going to go swimmingly. Everything's going to be under budget and ahead of schedule. And what do we read about? We read about the worst sin of Jewish history. Do you want to bring the Almighty into the world? Or do you want to bring an idol And what happens right after the Jewish people atone for their sin? You get back to work. And maybe the lesson for us is, is that every project that we undertake will have its phase where there's going to be despair. Will we accomplish what we want to accomplish? Will there be success or not? Every project's going to have its golden calf. And maybe it's kind of reassuring to read that even after the huge mistake, the huge blunder, it's still possible to build that magnificent edifice. And the Torah details every step of the the building process, and it seems to be exactly like how it was conceived earlier, to tell us that really there was nothing lost along the way. The, the, The misstep of the golden calf did not have any lasting effects. I once heard from one of my teachers something very scary, and he said that Every couple that gets married, they're sure, at least at some point in the early stages of their marriage, they're, sh- they're sure that they married the wrong one. They're sure. They made a mistake. Can't be. Can't be that this is the right one. Which to me, that was an astonishing statement. But I think in this light, you know, two people want to get married and they want to build something incredible together. It's almost inevitable that there's going to be some failure in the interim The grand plans are going to be disrupted, but they're not going to be upended. It's still possible to implement those plans. And therefore, reading about how nothing was lost, I think, could provide us a nice degree of consolation. The Parsha, and indeed the book, concludes that God instructed Moses on the day of the first new moon, on the first of the month, which is the first day of Nisan, you erect the tabernacle, the tabernacle of meeting. Again, we go through all the details of assembling and setting up the Mishkan, the tabernacle. The tabernacle is erected. Moshe puts all the vessels in the correct place. He does it in a very specific order. Everything is completed, and the book ends. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Hashem filled the tabernacle. 
Moses was not able to enter. There was such intensity in God's presence. He was only able to enter once the intense cloud subsided a little bit. And this cloud would also indicate when it was time for the Jews to embark on their journeys. And the Parsha and the book of Exodus ends for the cloud of Hashem would be in the tabernacle by day and fire would be on it by night before the eyes of all of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Chazak, chazak, venis chazak. Be strong, be strong. May we be strengthened. We have concluded the book of Exodus. The Mishnah, the tabernacle, has been completed. And I think of this uh, somewhat like a, like a lunar mission. You know, we're going to the moon. You spend all that time detailing every aspect of the spacecraft, every aspect of the suits, of the astronauts. Everything is planned down to perfection. And finally, we have liftoff and everything works out exactly as promised. The presence of God indeed is dwelling in the tabernacle.